Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to uh, welcome Juliet Carey, um, not least because, uh, oh, and I'm about to blow my own trumpet. <laughs> when, when I gave a talk about uh, packing and transport of um, objects, I did say that it's an incredibly difficult subject to research because the packing cases generally never survive. However, this is a case in which they do survive. And the story they tell is quite fascinating. Juliet, over to you. There we go. Okay, thank you. This talk is about some beautifully made packing cases that have fascinated me for years. The boxes were made in the second half of the 19th century to store serf porcelain, small marbles and antiquities, among other things, and we still use them at Wadstone Manor. The slide you see now shows some of the boxes stacked in the fireplace of the red drawing room. Ah. Oh, gosh, sorry. This is the red drawing room on the left in its display mode. Some of the serve vases stored in boxes during the winter are visible on the mantelpiece. Wadston Manor was built around 1880 for Baron Ferdinand de Rothschild, a member of the Rothschild banking dynasty, which had its origins in the Frankfurt ghetto. He was born in Paris, raised in Frankfurt and Vienna, and settled and married in England. The house looks like a French Renaissance chateau and is quite a surprise when first glimpsed on top of a hill in Buckinghamshire. The rooms inside are lined with French 18th century panelling and stuffed full of French decorative arts, English, French and Dutch paintings and Germanic Kunstkammer objects. However, the boxes that I'm showing you today did not originate in England. They were made for Baron Edmond de Edmond de Rothschild, who was a cousin of Wadston's Baron Ferdinand. This is Edmond de Rothschild here in a drawing by Leon Baxt, which is at Wadston. And he was part of the French branch of the family and assembled his collections for houses in France, many houses in France. I show you three slides of 41 Rue de Faubourg Saint-Honoré, which is now the American embassy. But there was also 29 Avenue du Bois de Boulogne and the Chateau this is, uh, sorry, this is Faubourg Saint-Honoré. But there's also the Chateau Rothschild Boulogne sur Seine and the Chateau d'Armanville in seine Emane. And he used other family properties at Ferrières and Cannes. We do not know exactly how Edmond de Rothschild moved his collection around, but works of art would have been packed away in boxes when he was absent and a house closed up and they may have been used to transport particular works of art between residences, a bit like a medieval king and his tapestries. Boxes at the Villa Efrussi de Rothschild at Cap Ferrat were created for that very reason. Beatrice Efrussi de Rothschild moved favorite things around with her, marking certain items as finishing touches when she arrived at one of her houses. These two slides show the box for a clock. There's the particularly ridiculous pink clock for which the box is. Edmond's boxes came to Wadston with the part of his collection that was inherited by his son James on the right, who settled in England. He was naturalized around 19, in, in 1920. Arguably the greatest collector in a family of collectors, Edmond de Rothschild's vast collections have long been the focus of scholarly attention, and art historians have looked at how he displayed his art and made it available to friends and the wider public. This is the room in Paris where he kept his prints and drawings, in leather portfolios in shelves with paintings and sculptures above. The chairs and tables suggest the sociable context of the study and enjoyment of the works of art housed there. But this talk is not about Baron Edmond's works of art, but about the book boxes in which he stored some of them when they were not on show. The boxes are highly crafted objects, pleasing to the eye and to the touch. And here are some of them again, just some among those you'll see are Edmond's stacked in the fireplace to protect serve vases during the closed season at Wadston. Edmond de Rothschild's boxes are constructed of wood, and lined with chamois leather, usually red, but sometimes beige. Many of the boxes bear a red leather label lettered in gold. 
This is the box for a particularly large of porcelain vase, potpourri vase, the so-called Copenhagen vase. And the box helps the viewer to study it. The vase is so big that it's difficult to handle, dangerous to turn upside down, but the box positions it so that one can see the inside of the cover and the marks on the base. This slide shows the strip of beige chamois added to protect the edge of the cover from the body of the vase when the two parts are put together for display, the object protected from itself. This slide shows that the interiors of the storage boxes do relate in some way to the display of works of art, such as the little plush velvet stands or the flesh colored bases on which the vases are secured. And here's another little red platform. And it's instructive to compare Edmond's boxes with those of his cousin, Ferdinand. Ferdinand owned three vases vessel à main, these masted ship vases. When they were put away for the winter, they were stored in much less splendid boxes. Hang on, I'll go back to that one. This is just one of Ferdinand's horrible pine boxes for the ship vases, which are the greatest trophies of all in the world of surf collecting. And the boxes do, the boxes do their job, providing a solid shell for the vases with padded edges to the arm and openings, for example. You can see how the shaped planks slot around the vase to keep it stable, but it's always unnerving pushing these pieces of wood back into place, like one's going to chop off the top of the vase. Here is, so there it is with the planks removed and you slot one in um, to meet the almond shape opening around the neck of the bars. The crude, yeah, sorry, there it is closed. I'm going in the wrong direction. Crude nail holes in the ceiling of the box show that there once were kidney shaped pads to cushion the top of the vase, but when closed, the space between the knob of the vase and the lid of the box is, is really only a few millimetres. Edmond's boxes are of another order, with their beautiful corner joins, polished exterior surfaces, flush fitted brass fixtures, and flush interiors. The leather labels relate them visually to the binding of the books and to the tooled leather portfolios and boxes in which Edmond kept his drawings and prints. The chamois linings of the boxes, animal skin, recalls long traditions of leather cases for precious objects. For example, the covers of scientific instruments. Here, a Louis XV microscope at the Getty. Walter Benjamin described the 19th century Parisian interior as like an upholstered compass case, which seems appropriate to this discussion of upholstered cases made to house works of art in 19th century Paris. But of course, it was not only scientific instruments that were cushioned and protected inside suede or velvet lined leather cases. This is contains for princely treasures in Augustus the Strong's green vaults at Dresden, the most magnificent collection of such cases, or etuis as they're known, is in Madrid, made for the treasure of the Grand Dauphin of France. And here's just a handful of them, made of leather, boiled for shape, stamped for decoration, and covered in brocade or velvet. Containers such as these announce that objects that announce that they contain objects that travel and can be displayed in different locations, and that the collection is large enough to need storage and to need identifying marks on the outside of the boxes. The interiors of these cases are like nests shaped exactly to receive the object. This ghost space, for example, tells us the shape of a lost work. And here's a rather less seductive modern equivalent, the ghost spaces in plasters oak line trays on the top right, or tissue paper nests for 18th century fans in the bottom right. Alison Stilau has written inspiringly about Renaissance tattoo, made for the most part by court bookbinders and integral to the presentation of the treasures they housed. The containers were laden with significance in their own right, meanings mobilized by representation in other works of art. For example, in Martin Schoengauer's Adoration of the Magi. Look at the leather etui with carrying straps being pushed into a sack by the figure just visible on the right. This is the case for the bulbous vessel being offered to Christ at the same moment. 
part of the theme of what Stilau calls the movement of goods and people through space that became an increasingly visible marginal subject in pictures of the adoration. The inclusion of the etui makes the Magi's gifts not only symbolic offerings, but also crafted vessels requiring material protection and care, to quote Stilau. In other works, empty etui act as vanitas for symbols, for example, in Holbein's The Ambassadors. The empty lute case underneath the table contrasts with the case for the wind instrument on the bottom shelf to the right that still has its pipes in it. Unlike Edmond's boxes, most of the French made etui, another here for the Grand Dauphin's treasure, are embellished on the outside. The exteriors tell us the shape of the object inside, such as this dolphin shaped one. However, other aspects of the aesthetics of these cases are shared by Edmond's later wooden boxes. For example, as we shall see later, the fabrication of the box creates anticipation and surprise. The drama of the reveal is central to how they work, part of the staging of the work of art for the viewer's delight, cushioned in color. Before moving on, I want to show you a Renaissance object that was in Rothschild ownership in the 19th century, complete with its leather case, a miniature boxwood tabernacle owned by Ferdinand de Rothschild, part of what he called his Renaissance Museum at Wadston, which at his death he bequeathed to the British Museum with the Wadston bequest. Also part of that Wadston bequest is this pair of early 16th century portrait sculptures by Conrad Bates showing Margaret of Austria, regent of the Netherlands, and her husband, Philibert of Savoy. They were once owned by the Holy Roman Emperor, Rudolf II, who protected their delicate surfaces by keeping them in wooden boxes lined with fur. Examples such as these emphasize the princely traditions implicit in the aesthetics of Edmond's boxes, but they are also embedded in other traditions of packing precious things. For example, they demonstrate continuity with 18th century Parisian expertise in packaging and transportation. This is one example, and I'm grateful to John Whitehead for the photograph. I love the way the closed box challenges us to imagine how the porcelain and glass vessels can possibly be arranged to fit in, but they do. This is a box for served dessert plates made for Napoleon around 1810. And this is a box for a serve porcelain service that belonged to the Paris Rothschilds, including M during the 19th century. The porcelain was probably bought in Vienna, but the box was certainly made in France. It reminds me of letters written by the Duchess of Manchester in 1783 about another serve service. She was fretting how to transport this service safely to England, the Manchester service, which had been presented to her by Louis XVI after the Duke of Manchester had helped to negotiate the Treaty of Versailles, which brought about the end of the War of American Independence. One expense that particularly vexed the Duchess during a very expensive year was having to pay 56 Louis for the packing up of my china, I do grudge so much money for boxes, paper and moss, she added. I love the idea of porcelain protected by moss. Some serve at this time was protected in sand and acorns too were used for packing. The marble statues that Thomas Cook brought back from his grand tour were packed into wooden crates and held in place with twigs and acorns of evergreen home oaks, which Thomas then planted in his brand new park at Hokum Hall but moss was the right material for the Duchess of Manchester's serve. She had asked the director at serve to send her someone to pack the porcelain. And she wrote, the man he sent is the person employed by everybody as well as by the manufactory and is the only one whom he will ensure packing it safe. He could recommend me another person who he could almost be certain would do so too, but not absolutely sure. And the difference of the price I would find, I find, would only be the saving about eight louis or ten at most, and therefore to run any risk for China of so much value is not worthwhile. So malgré moi, I must pay fifty-six louis pour l'embaillage. Such expensive packing was in itself a display of wealth and status. She did concede that when she saw the packer at work, she realised why it was so costly. The manner the figures are packed up is every one in a separate case, and the case is made with hinges so that all the sides fall down and shut with clasps. 
for not a nail is put in as the knock of a hammer would jar the china and break it all to pieces. Edmond Gilles would have appreciated this 18th century care in packing ceramics. This is an 18th century trade card for a certain Osondo at Wadston, who made crates in wood for transported furniture and objects. But the most refined leather boxes with fitted interiors were made by members of the Guild of Guénier. You see here um, an example, um, uh, illustration from the Encyclopédie. There are large cases for musical instruments and tiny ones for eyeglasses and scissors on the shelves behind the craftsmen. For ages, we did not know who made Edmond's boxes, but clever colleagues, uh, Mia Jackson and Jane Finch, recently found behind a loose brass number panel, a manufacturer's label for Chenu. And here is a Chenu van in the 18th century, in the 19th century. The company was founded in 1760 and made its name packing Marie Antoinette's layette, which is the linen for mother, child and crib, and eventually took on the packing of all the royal linen. It's still the leading company in France for the packing and transporting of works of art. And it's hard to imagine Edmond de Rothschild commissioning any other case makers to make his boxes. He took an intense interest in the packing of his possessions. In June 1882, he wrote to a British consul in Morocco about the preparation for travel of some faience mosaics. He was getting them for the revêtement de deux pièces de mon hôtel. Maybe this is a very blurry photograph, but maybe this room was one of them that he was redoing. He wanted each mosaic panel fixed into its own box with large sheets of paper inside pressed against each ceramic fragment so that no single piece would become detached during its journey by ship and by wagon. This attention to the relationship between the rigid outside and the softer inside reminds me of the Wadston boxes, but on a much larger scale. The Edmond de Rothschild collection at the Louvre provo provides more evidence of his highly developed interest in the protection of the collection. He left strict rules about the prints and drawings that he left to the museum. He wanted to control from the grave how they were kept and handled. According to his instructions, they were to be stored together separately from other works in the museum, in mounts, boxes and shelves whose design he stipulated. As an aside here, it interests me that Edmond de Rothschild did not stamp his drawings and prints with the collector's mark, although this was habitual among 19th century collectors who fashioned themselves as collectors. Is his presence as their owner made concrete in a clear but non-permanent way through the enfolding, wrapping and distinctive boxing of his objects. Taking works out of their boxes worried him. People consulting his drawings and prints had to look at them through a sheet of glass. People looking at albums had to do so through a veil of tracing paper. Tracing paper because glass would press too much on the album's spine. Edmond had once turned away a foreign visitor who had come a long way to see his collection because the scholar had a bad cold. So perhaps he was particularly worried by the sneezes of the future public at the Louvre. In her biography of Edmond de Rothschild, Elisabeth Antebi described the prints and drawings that were the heart of his collection as part of the culture of the flaneur rather than the culture of display, far from ostentation and market speculation. Antebi argues that they were about private enjoyment shared with a small group of initiates, about enjoyment of beauty and fear of death. Edmond said that he feared completing his collection and he feared completing its setting. He said, as long as the house is not finished, death cannot come. Antebi links Edmond's collecting, his obsession with authenticity and quality, and his powerful sense of the precariousness of his collection with his spirituality. And I wonder if his preoccupation with the practicalities of boxing, transporting and protecting his collection can be added to this. Each box makes of a work of art something precious that can be displayed with great brilliance, but that also has an existence and an aesthetically pleasing existence cushioned and revered in a box. There is not always a simple split between display and storage, exposing an object for display and placing it in a box out of sight. 
Living with my teenage daughter over the year of lockdown has made me aware of the drama of the boxing and the unboxing of things. She has introduced me to the weird phenomenon of unboxing videos of shoes, iPhones, all kinds of desirable objects. Unboxing is a drama that relies on the significance of the boxing up in the first place. Boxing something can paradoxically show it off, perpetuate information about its provenance, and make visible its value. The Japanese tradition of the tomoboko is interesting here, made to house particularly prized porcelain wares made of special wood from a special tree. These boxes are often inscribed with the name of their owner and more recently with the name of their maker. The box and opening of the box to reveal what is inside adds meaning to the object inside. Here, the plastic covering on the lid highlights the value placed on the box itself as the plastic protects the inscriptions on the lid. Traditions developed around the closing of the box too, not least in the way a textile tape is tied around the outside. Like Edmond's boxes, they can have textile cushioning inside the base. Some are wrapped in cloth as well as tied with tape. This covering of something precious to express reverence also reminds me of religious practices, not least the way these Torah scrolls, for example, are kept hidden and safe with a combination of rigid housing and textile covering. This slide shows the Torah scrolls boxed and textile covered on the altar table of the Grand Synagogue de la Victoire in France, the Rothschild Synagogue, uh, built in 1874, funded by Edmond de Rothschild. Edmond's boxes at Wadston certainly protect their contents, but they also function as frameworks for display. They place their contents in contexts ranging from erudition to the erotic. This is a box made to contain antiquities found in Palestine. Edmond funded many archeological expeditions. The box has layers to store, but also to present, present to the viewer different objects in different ways. The lining is predominantly sandy colored, but the very bottom layer is lined in red silk with little compartments like a jewelry box. This change in color is carefully considered because small, mainly gold objects are stored there, some of which is jewelry. The two trays above are covered in beige chamois and contain Roman glass vessels. This is the uppermost layer. The arrangement of Roman glass resembles didactic illustrations in books on antiquities. This is a plate from the Comte Caelus Recueil d'Antiquité, a founding example of that tradition. This box is much larger than all the others you have seen, but of similar appearance. It has double doors that open outwards. The labels show that they were made for furniture. There are two boxes like this lined in wool. Both were made for furniture by Martin Carlin, inlaid with Sèvres porcelain plaques. This sli the slide includes a third, there, there's the boxes. And this, this slide includes a third piece of furniture with Sèvres porcelain plaques for which we've also recently found a box. All three pieces inlaid with porcelain. So far I've found no other examples of Edmond boxing furniture in this manner. So I propose that it tells us something about how the collector categorized these particular pieces, like his serve uh, vases, rather than with other examples of French cabinet making. And I'd be fascinated to know if anyone else boxed furniture in this way. So far, I have found no other examples of Edmond boxing furniture in this manner. Oh, sorry, I've just said that, ignore that. As we've seen, Edmond was not the only Rothschild to use boxes for storing, organizing, protecting, and moving his collection. We've already seen Ferdinand's much more prosaic one for the ship bars, for example, and Beatrice's smart example for the pink clock. Edmond's wife, Edelheid, stored her collection of buttons in boxes within boxes. This, sh this shows just a few of the really wonderful buttons. Unlike Edmond having his boxes specially made, the Baroness bought the little boxes. There's a, sh there's a shop label inside the lid, you can see on the right, and presumably chose either from her collection or acquired specially for the purpose, the large and spectacular Japanese lacquer chest in which she housed them. There's the outside, there's the inside. 
It must have been fun to open the big outer box, raising the lid and surveying the multitude of other little boxes inside, none of which would have given much hint of the appearance of buttons inside the boxes, inside the box. Edelheid's experience would have been more about surveying from above a whole collection of small things or rummage, rummaging in it, depending on the degree of order in which she kept it. The most elaborate of Edmond's boxes, at least the most elaborate that I have found so far, offered a very different experience. And this is my favorite box of all, for a marble nymph by Etienne Maurice Falconet, and it creates a drama of enclosure, hiding and revealing. The first three slides show the box closed. Then with the lid open and looking down into the box. And then one wing opens and the second. There is no practical reason that the figure could not have been placed in a depression inside the base of the box. Instead, the box gives the sculpture a little internal plinth, which with the double doors makes it like a secular triptych or profane shrine. You pull the figure towards you by pulling on the tab at the front. The concavities in the padded lining combine practicality with private sensuality. The more time the nymph spends in the box, the more precisely the dimples in the padding match her contours. Here, the concavities formed by her head and hair and here for her knee. In the case of this particular box, the natural colored chamois chosen for the lining seems flesh colored, warm, soft and giving against the marvel. And two more views of it. But for all their sensual appeal, the history of Edmond's boxes underlines the protection they have given to their contents through time. They are solid, functional boxes this nasty paper label shows how they continue to be used to protect things inside. And they have safeguarded their contents through very real dangers and dark times indeed. In an unfinished memoir, Edmond cites events during the 1848 revolution as some of his earliest memories. He was not yet three. He writes, my first memories date from the time of Napoleon III's coup d'etat. Looking back, I can still see all the panic-stricken housemaids in my nursery when they heard the shots in the street. He explained that during his lifetime, the history of the terror still remained in people's minds at the thought of the horrors of the French Revolution. In 1870 to 71, during the siege of Paris by the Prussians, Edmond was 26 and a soldier in the Garde Mobile. He wrote, I do not want to describe the siege of Paris, and he does not go into any detail about what he called the privations and hardships of that terrible icy winter. He talks about eating elephants and kangaroo from the zoo, but keeps an emotional distance in his account by concentrating on military, political and economic narratives of the siege and the commune that followed it. This slide shows a lithograph of the burning of the city. And here, Napoleon, a statue of Napoleon being toppled. There is much more research to be done on Edmond's experiences in and around Paris at this time, and of desperate violence much further afield in the following decade. He was much affected, for example, by news of the pogroms in Russia. And I wonder if these experiences affected the way he perceived dangers to his collection and the way he cared for it. This is an area where I want to research further, but for the moment, two verbal descriptions of boxes for works of art during the siege of Paris have stuck in my mind. Not Edmond's descriptions, but from the journal of the collector, writer and publisher, Edmond de Goncourt, who said of September 1870, it is not life to go on living in this great and terrifying unknown which surrounds you and crushes you. On September the 3rd, 1870, Goncourt met a curator, Charles-Philippe de Chenevière, coming out of the Louvre, who told him he was going to Brest to escort a consignment of paintings taken out of their frames and rolled up to be saved from the Prussians. Chenevière described what he called the sad and humiliating spectacle of this packing and another curator weeping hot tears before Raphael's La Belle Jardinière at the bottom of the packing case as if she were a dead friend ready to be nailed up in her coffin. 
In the evening, Goncourt saw outside a railway station 17 cases containing the Antiope, the finest Venetians, etc. Those pictures, he, this is quoting him, those pictures which believed they were to hang on the walls of the Louvre for all eternity and which are now mere luggage protected against the accidents of removal only by the world fragile. If the traumatic experience of his own times heightened Edmond de Rothschild's sense of the vulnerability of life and objects, for his collection, the worst danger came a few years after his death. He died in 1934. During the Second World War, the Nazis took much of Edmond's collection from his heirs. This box has a stamp of the UAR, the, ta the task force uh, doing the looting of objects from Jews in Paris. A photograph shows them stacked in a Paris depot. Compare them to the more vulnerable unboxed works from other big Jewish collections on the right. In another photograph, one of Edmond's boxes serves as a writing desk for a clerk making notes about the transportation of his collection. Looking at Edmond's boxes, a furniture historian recently, Matthew Benjamin, was reminded of a description of Stefan Zweig's visit to an exhibition of furniture with the German Jewish writer Otto Zarek. They went to this exhibition in the 1920s. Looking at some giant medieval chests, Stefan Zweig asked, can you tell me which of these chests belonged to Jews? Zarek was baffled as there were no obvious marks of ownership on any of the chests. Zweig smiled. Do you see these two here, he said. They are mounted on wheels. They belong to Jews. Yes, these chests on wheels are striking symbols of the Jewish fate. One can follow the looting, recording and transportation of the Rothschild boxes to the gathering place in the Jeu de Pomme and thence to various depots, including the so-called Lager Peter in the Alte See salt mines in Austria. These precarious journeys lie behind an installation about objects, vitrines, and boxes that the ceramic artist Edmund de Waal made in response to the site of the storage boxes stacked up in the fireplaces on the fireplace at Wadston, the site that inspired him on the left that you're familiar with now, and on the right is Edmund's um, piece on the properties of fire, which he made in 2012. De Waal says that he wanted to make something that could give the feeling of being on the point of being packed up, ready for transit. Photographed still and safe in the fireplace, in, sorry, that's his piece. Photographed still and safe in the fireplace at Wadston. Ironically, the fireplace is the safest place in the event of a house fire. The boxes resonate with memories of journeys between houses, between depots, between countries, and between generations. You can recognize Edmond boxes, Edmond's boxes now, alongside cruder, later versions of them made for his son, son James, as well as some of those with Ferdinand's. And I hope you can now visualize something of what is going on inside them and the pleasure that some lucky person will have unpacking them when the time comes, as it does each year, to put their contents back on display in the bigger box that is Wadston. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was quite wonderful. Now, do we have any questions? Um, if you'd like to uh, where's the, put any questions in the Q&A, no question. There's something in chat is that a question hang on yeah i'm okay. just at that. <laughs> no um somebody must have a question <laughs> nothing nothing at all well oh no yes here's one <laughs> No, no, just complimenting. Oh, do you have keys to the boxes? Um, you know, that's really good. Well, any that have keys, we do. I'm just going back um, to see where the keyholes. We we have some of them have keyholes. I wonder if they all do. 
And it's just a really good question. Yes, no, they, they do, they do. And we do, yes, we do have keys to the, because we use them. So we lock them and unlock them. We do have keys, but I, sorry, it's, I'm now flicking through to see whether they all have keys, but um, uh, that, that's the useful question. Yes, we do, is the answer. I don't want them flying open. No. <laughs> At the wrong moment. Yes. Um, nobody else? Oh yes, here we go. Uh, what is the reasoning behind packing them up every year? Well, lots of, um, it, it's a thing, it's very normal in large collections and, and country houses so that works, it, it allows for proper, proper cleaning. It rests certain objects from the light. Obviously porcelain, for example, doesn't need to be rested from the light, but by taking everything off display, it allows you to do proper, proper cleaning. And um, so, some things do need to be uh, rested from light. So it's the, I suppose it evolves from the idea that if the owner's not in residence um, and not uh, needing to enjoy the things, then you take them off and you extend their life by taking them off display. Um, and as I say, allowing for cleaning. But it's a very normal thing. At Wadston, we call it um, slightly tweely, putting the house to bed is, is the phrase that has um, gone down uh, the, the generations. But it's a very normal thing to do in large collections. Um, there's a question on the chat as well. Second, uh, there's another one here. Let me get down the, all the ones in the Q&A and then I'll come to the chat. Um, can you relate it all to the philosophies of the Wunderkammer? Um, it uh, seems almost the reverse. Um, well, uh, do, do you mean in, in, in the sense that it's not display or that they're very different types of boxes? Because a, a Wunderkammer has, has a great tradition of, of boxing um, and revealing, if you think of some of those wonderful kind of cabinets where you open doors and then doors within doors and boxes within the doors and, and that sort of penetrating further and further into a cabinet or, or also it's a room scale into a room. Um, there's an element of that, but that, of course, is part of the, the permanent display. So I suppose what I'm trying to suggest is that even something off display um, can have these kind of dramas of um, opening and closing or being shown in a different way when it's in the context of these boxes, that you experience the object differently, whether um, for, for sort of being able to study it reasons or to differentiate between different types of object that sort of thing how it would, i'd be interested to know what what the questioner means about it being the opposite it, it, is, it is in some ways the opposite um of the wunderkammer etui maybe is the thought behind it is that emma would you like to um uh those those are three those boil the renaissance boxes the renaissance are three that's much more in a in a in a sort of wunderkammer tradition is that that's the sort of world perhaps you're thinking of and they are indeed as i tried to suggest they are different in that they tell you a lot more about the object from the outside for example um than these boxes which in a way um distance you from, from the outside you just see a box you don't know what's inside except from the label so they're, they're different now um with matthew beasley again what type of timber was used in the construction of the boxes i, I think they're oak i think they're oak. i, I hesitate now because i i should check that again but i i think they're oak um I need to get up a slide again, but they're, mu they're, they're, they're much better wood, for example, than the pine of Ferdinand's, which are really, um, I shouldn't do them down, they do their job, but they're, they're nasty compared to the polished oak. Okay, um, are pests such as moths in the linings a problem? Um, you this, this I'm I'm very much a curator enjoying these boxes rather than, than the conservation stewards who have to look after them. I know that that you there there are there is evidence sometimes of creatures getting in, but they they do their job surprise you know really well considering they're you know they're upholstered and padded and stuff. There's an awful lot of organic materials that that, that pests could and I've 
um, I, wh however much they're a threat, I don't know. I know our conservation stewards do an incredible job of keeping the pests out. Um, but, but yes, they are vulnerable to that. Okay, now this is uh, Candice Griggs. She says it, it's about the Edmund Duval installation. Yeah. You mentioned, mentioned an artist being inspired by the boxes in the fireplace, but, didn't, but I didn't quite understand what his resultant artwork was. Can you clarify? Yeah, so it's a, it's a vitrine. In fact, if I remember right, it's a, it's a metal vitrine um, with porcelain vessels inside it. Um, and then it's placed within the fireplace where we normally have those uh, protective wooden boxes stuffed full with their porcelain objects. So he was making a piece, it was part of a much larger um, intervention throughout the ground floor of Wadston in 2012, which was um, about all sorts of uh, kind of themes of diasporic objects and the movement of objects, the vulnerability of objects, the placing of objects, the using of objects um, in, in a Wadston context. But that particular piece, that was the, that was the largest, most, most ambitious kind of centerpiece uh, installation, I suppose, in a way. And so he was, he, it was the first time that he'd, if I remember, I think it's right to say it was the first time that he'd ever actually used vitrines literally in his piece, in his sculptures. Um, as you perhaps know, if you've read uh, The Hair with Amber Eyes, he's absolutely fascinated by vitrines and the, and the showing of objects in cases and the selecting of objects and the taking them out of cases, putting them back into cases, rearranging them in glass cases. Um, it's something that he's been, he was already fascinated by, but this was, this was the first time that he'd used it as part of his, his works of art. And it, and it came directly from that sight of seeing the, the collection boxed up in, in the fireplace. But it was a metal vitrine with uh, ceramic vessels inside. Okay. Um, Katerina Powell, do the boxes sometimes need repair and have you had to find a conservator for them? <laughs> I'm embarrassed. I'm, I, I'm sure they have, and I don't know who's conserved them. My, my colleague, um, Colette Warbrick, is on the line. If by any chance Colette uh, hears this and knows the answer um, to who conserves them, um, please let me know. Colette, if, yes, I'll, I'll move um, that. I, I, I think probably we've dealt with things in-house. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, hinges are the obvious things that, yeah. but, but no, honestly, I'm sorry. Yes. I, <laughs> I realise I'm suddenly in the presence of an awful lot of conservators. And, um, yes, I'm sorry. I'm a mere I, curator. I failed, failed please please absolutely. forgive me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, Colette, I don't mean to put okay. you in the spot. <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Matthew Beasley again. Presumably the timber is stained and polished for as for traditional French polishing, question mark. Um, they are they are shiny and sheeny. I'm a, I'm afraid I'd, I'd need to, to ask a furniture expert how I how to describe the actual polishing. Um, I'm out of my uh, depth. depth here. Uh, okay, let's have a quick look in the chat. Uh, well, hang on. It's very useful, all these, these questions about um, the materiality, French okay. polishing question mark I'm putting on my notes. Um, hang on. Are any boxes too fragile to be used anymore? If so, do you replicate the box in modern materials or pack another way? Um, I don't know if any have been actually taken out of service. I, I would expect that if they were, we would no, we wouldn't create a replica box. We would pack the object to be safe in whatever the best modern ways were. We wouldn't, we wouldn't make a new box in this idiom. Okay, here's one. Um, what were Edmund de Rothschild's instructions for wrapping and packing of paintings? Um, 
Well, those the, the, the typed instructions I showed were all about uh, how the public should look at drawings and prints. Um, it's a very good question. Um, I, I don't know if he left instructions for other works of art that he gave to museums. Um, the, the drawings and prints were a very, very special, um, enormous gift. It was, it was basically his works on paint, paper were the gift that, that triggered the creation at last of a proper uh, drawings room, a proper um, drawings and print study room at the Louvre, for example. Um, so, so it was a massive uh, donation um, and came with you know, furniture and instructions and uh, boxes and all that. But it's a very good question. Um, I'll, I'll look into it if he, other works that he gave had instructions similarly. Yes, please let me know and I'll yeah. eliminate it. Um, also, if an object was to be transported from Wadston on loan, for example, would you transport it in the original box? Uh, no, I, I would have thought, but sorry, I'm, now again, I'm just, uh, I think when we send things, we would send it in whatever is the most appropriate conservation recommended manner for transporting objects now. Um, we wouldn't. It's a bit like, um, oh, you know, if you if you if you lend a painting, you'll often have a, a simpler uh, frame made for it to to travel to an exhibition. We we don't, for example, there's a very very particular, very elaborate rococo frame for a painting that we don't send uh, with the painting when it travels. It has a simpler a simpler one. Um, so no, we 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 transport things in whatever is the most appropriate way. Though most of these works of art, actually the ones I've, I've shown you, all, all the ceramics I've shown you and the little nymph, they're all National Trust objects. Um, and the terms of the bequest to the National Trust in 1957 mean they couldn't be lent anyway. So that's an academic question for those. But if there are objects on loan, again, I, could, I couldn't tell you if there are objects on loan from, a pri from the private collection, that we would be legally allowed to lend, they would, I'm sure, be taken out of their historic boxes and packed in modern ways. Okay. Um, and then there's, there's a question that relates, as it were, to the one on instructions for paintings. All the boxes you've shown for the objects, do they have any boxes for paintings? Um, no, not that I can think of, no. But it's an interesting question, and it, it makes me wonder whether, you know, there may be some. I, I, I ought to look into it whether Edmond de Rothschild had any similar boxes, for example, for very small panel paintings. I can imagine he might, but I'm just speculating. So yes. I need to look into that. It's a very good question. Before we, you know, sort of started the talk, we were discussing how people live, seem to live differently now with their objects. How, how can you say the royal courts expected to travel with all their bits and pieces, but now today, you know, it seems that you don't um, demand that the painting that is at one end of Europe is above your fireplace at the other end of Europe so you can um, impress your friends, yeah. politicians. Um, for a dinner party, uh, it, it, but maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Maybe you move in the wrong circles. I mean, with the exception of exhibitions, mm. um, it's my impression that objects and paintings are not moved mm. um, as their owners move. But um, it, yeah, I'd be interested to know of examples. I'd, I'd also be interested to know. I mean, that that anecdote about. Um, Beatrice Efrusi Rothschild sort of unpacking key objects, particularly I think serve objects, sort of as she took up residence in one of her houses. So it's like the kind of finishing touch, you know, you can imagine the drama of her sort of plonking, you know, not plonking, carefully placing yeah. some <laughs> final vase, you know, on a commode or something to say, I am back in residence. That that's an that's something that my colleague Ulrich Leben told me. Um and he, and I, I just, I'd be very interested to know if, if anybody else comes across other examples of that in, in the 19th or early or 20th century, or indeed you, now. You talked about, was it the Duke of Buccleur 
Um, yeah, the Duke of Buccleuch, the old Duke of Buccleuch, supposedly used to take his Leonardo that is probably, you know, it's a Luini, I think, whatever, the Leonardo, Madonna of the Yardwinder. He used to take it back and forth to, to Scotland um, in a velvet bag, um, apparently. Well, why not? If you've got why Leonardo. not? I mean, you know, wouldn't you? <laughs> you know, but, um, but yeah, that idea of, of sort of kind of moving with certain objects, um, almost as an emblem that you're there, you know, that you're in residence. I, I'm not sure. But I, I, I like the idea and I, I think it's, um, there's obviously truth in, in, in some examples of it. And also the, the, the drama of, un, of unpacking, uh, the actual owner unpacking objects. There are, there are letters, there are examples, and um, people have told me of, examples of aristocrats sort of physically themselves with their own hands unpacking new acquisitions or unpacking things when they traveled um, so that clearly there are some boxes that are very much in the housekeeper's domain and some boxes that you can well imagine an owner taking pleasure I mean sure I cannot believe that um, Edmond de Rothschild wouldn't have enjoyed the opening and closing of that little nymph that is not a purely um, you know functional box uh, I, I can't believe it though annoyingly there is no letter saying you know I spent yesterday evening opening and closing my nymph in her box I wish there were but um, sometimes um, the, the importance in Sèvres with Sèvres porcelain for example the end of year the new year exhibitions in the 18th century when when the vases were were first made the flashes vases from the manufactory part of the drama of making a big uh, kind of great promotion of the latest wares of the factory was actually that that Louis the Sixteenth, Louis sorry Louis the Fifteenth and Madame de Pompadour themselves would sometimes unpack the newest wares out of their boxes and put them on display for their courtiers to then compete to buy them. So that's a very early example of <laughs> the actual Christmas old, aspect to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the two more questions here. Uh, were dried food items box, such as tea and fruit, with similar impeccably craft finesse? This is the tradition of, you know, those wonderful tea boxes, isn't it? Yes, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought. I mean, those tea boxes, that's very much about, you know, showing that you've got a very precious commodity like like spice you know wonderful things in silver and gold for precious spices i i don't know how i i mean presumably they were they were shipped on ships in in different sorts of crates i'm afraid i don't i don't know about that i mean i do own i own a, a tea box but it's not got any of its interior mm. in it. Mm. and it is beautifully french polished yeah, yeah. and so on um, and one final question, I think, how many boxes are there? <laughs> yes. Well, that's a good question. I, you know, I haven't, I haven't counted everyone's boxes. I should, I should, I, I, I can't tell you. Um, I'm, I'm now um, counting up the sort of garnitures in rooms and little, little marble statues. I, I, sorry, I'm not going to give a guess. Um, a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, quite a lot. There are quite a lot. There are quite a lot. Um, I just don't think there's anything more um, in the chat. No. Um, well, that. Sorry, if we've got time, I'd love to ask a question. Carry on. Or make an observation, really. It was a really great talk. Thank you so much. But at the end of it, when you started talking about the Second World War, I can imagine, I mean, this is more of an observation, actually, but I can imagine that the boxes would have helped with. They, they, they massively helped. I mean, you can see how they helped and, um, you know, that they were solid enough that somebody could, that horrible photograph of the clerk using it as a desk. But also I, I found um, that, that the photograph of, of other, other vases and things. So it, 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 the, the, the reason I, there was a screenshot, one thing you probably couldn't see in detail because I just took the photograph um, of the screen because whenever I used one of those Nazi photographs, really weirdly, it, it kind of jinxed the entire PowerPoint and I lost all my slides. So I didn't dare do this again. So I just I just photographed it. So you probably couldn't see in detail because it wasn't a very good shot. But um 
but but those those vases were from very very major um, Jewish families in Paris. So the David Veals, you know, they they, they were very very uh, important objects comparable with the Edmond de Rothschild things. But which may, and the fact that they were all there, not in boxes, also does suggest to me that Edmond's boxing of his serve, though in a long tradition, was quite exceptional. I think it was. Yes, yes, there it is. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, this is a, a really fascinating book about it, um, that whole period. It's an analysis of a series of photographs and it's uh, well worth a, a read. Mm. You, yes. Yeah, I can imagine even now if you were still, if there were objects that were still lost or un, yeah. uh, unclaimed for, I can imagine that the boxes would somehow help with that or perhaps, I mean, I don't know how many boxes were misplaced or good during the Second World War, but um, I can imagine that it would have been a lot easier to track them down. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm and sure so, I'm boxes. sure so. And you know, yeah. and easily, yeah, it, just easier the, to move and store the, and pile up. I mean, it, they're only objects, like they're only objects, but they are very, yeah, it's, it's quite moving to. Yes, the ERR records are online. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, if you happen to know, what is it? Can you, you could, it, 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 this isn't um, good enough for you to see, but there is a number on this crate. And yeah. you can go online and there's- Yes, yes, you can look up all the details of all the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, no, it's, they're very, they're very good records. I do wonder now, so in a slightly um, a sort of unpleasant thought, I'm, not, I'm wondering whether Chanu were involved. I, well, I, I, I should find out before assuming, uh, but I wonder if uh, Chanu were involved in the actual transportation of the objects. Do you know, Claire? Well, I don't know specifically Chanu, but I know that the ERR, which I got from that this book, you. Yeah. Uh, normal fine art, no, yeah, yeah so they may have companies, yeah. Um, you know, I know, I know this because I think Picasso moved his sculpture and so yeah, on, yeah. fine art ones. And it's my impression that the um, Germans just used ordinary um, yeah. removal companies, but the bills that I, I can't entirely bring the figure up in. Um, in uh, old francs, but yeah. translated up into euros a couple of years back or so for just for one company for just something like two months. It was something like 18 million euros. Oh their bill. It's yeah. read the book. <laughs> yes, it yeah, is. I will. I will. And it gives you a sort of scale of exactly how much was moved around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, and, but as they kept very good records, and so yeah, long as we knew records. how to read the records. Um, but the, the um, Monuments Men Foundation have just um, produced a set of playing cards with the most uh, with the, 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 the most prominent missing things. Oh, really? Yes. That's, That's, quite wonderful. That's very clever. That's very clever. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's on it. But no, the box is certainly protected, all that stuff. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for answering. Okay. Well, <laughs> obviously, we've got to up our game in terms of wrapping Christmas presents. Uh, <laughs> leaves me to say thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um...